Fighting the Passions. Selected Letters from Archbishop Theophon of Poltava from the book titled Selected Letters. Letter 23. Fighting the Passions. Respected M.A., until we reach the harbor of dispassion, we must fight the passions and vain thoughts. There will be both victories and defeats, but we must conduct this battle until the end of our life. The battle will be successful only if it is conducted properly, and it will be conducted properly only if we depend not on our own might to conquer our passions and vain thoughts, but on God's might. In order to accomplish this, we must constantly call upon God to help us by incessant appeal in God's name. Virtue is two parts from God, says St. Gregory the Theologian, and one part from me. Beat the adversaries with the name of Jesus, for there is no more powerful weapon in heaven and on earth, said St. John of the Latter. He also stated, May remembrance of Jesus be united with your breathing. Thus, when we either forget to call upon the Lord to help us or depend too much on our own might, God's grace is withdrawn from us and we fall. What one should do in order to avoid this is obvious. When one's house is not in order, one must not attend to other things, leaving God to straighten it out. Letter 24. The Inner Struggle with Vain Thoughts and the Meaning of Humility You write that you are engaged in an inner struggle with vain thoughts, and that when you compel yourself to practice inner prayer, you feel that this obedience is difficult and that you are incapable of performing it. Both of these feelings show that you are on the right path. Both inner strife and the difficulty of an obedience of the heart cause a man to realize his own infirmities, and the realization of one's infirmities leads one to humility. St. Simeon, the new theologian, eloquently expressed the importance of humility for our salvation. There are two sacrifices which God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, accepts and which induce him to have mercy on an individual and on the world as a whole. One of these is our Lord Jesus Christ. God incarnate himself, and the other is the contrite and humble heart of every person who believes in him. A man does not have to give up anything else in exchange for his soul except the realization that he himself is nothing. Only then is he able to offer up to God a contrite and humble heart, the only sacrifice which is fitting for a pious individual to offer up to God. This is the only sacrifice which God will not despise knowing that a man has nothing of his own which he could offer up to God. You ask, when standing in prayer, should I recite the Jesus prayer a certain number of times or not? If so, how many? It is better for beginners to recite the prayer a certain number of times, and to ensure that they will not do it in a hurry, they should be assigned a small number of recitations. You may set the number yourself with the following restrictions. It should not be less than 30, and no more than 100, to be added to either the morning or the evening prayers, or to both, as time permits. Later, you may increase the number. You may certainly read the first volume of De Brotol Yubi, rest assured. When the monks return from Mount Athos, you may go to them for spiritual counsel, but only if you have specific questions which you want answered. Letter 27 Exhaustion during prayer and the concept of penance. What should I do, you ask, so that extreme exhaustion will not affect my concentration in prayer? You did not write what sort of prayer it is that you are asking about, private or in church. For this reason, I will give you two answers. When you begin to feel exhausted during a church service, you should recite the Jesus prayer to yourself. It will enable you to concentrate on prayer. If exhaustion strikes you while you are praying at home, you should force yourself somewhat to pray. If when you force yourself your exhaustion disappears, then this was a temptation from the evil one. But if it does not go away, then you can abbreviate your prayer. It is better to pray just a little, but thoughtfully and with feeling. You ask, By the way, during confession, Father V said that if I notice that I am sinning or neglecting something, I should make some prostrations. I have been wanting to ask you about this for some time. Please explain why. 
It is very helpful to do this, but only when one properly understands the nature of the matter. Penance is not, in the legal sense of the word, a punishment for a crime, but rather a spiritual remedy, the aim of which is to rid the person who uses it of a certain spiritual infirmity. The number of prostrations depends on the nature of the transgression or sin. Letter 8. Bishop Ignatius Briancheninov's Essays and the Proper Attitude Towards the Temptations Which Befall Us Honorable Father Archimandrite, I am very glad that you have required Bishop Briancheninov's Essays. Their content makes them especially suitable for contemporary scholarly monasticism. In them, the primordial ancient character of asceticism is harmoniously integrated with the conditions and peculiarities of modern-day life. For this reason, they require thorough study. You wrote that you are being assaulted by bouts of depression and bitterness. It is impossible for a monk to live without sorrows and temptations. St. Macarius the Great said, The action of God's grace is revealed in a man and he receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, with which a faithful soul is honored, only after prolonged struggles, after great trials of his patience and generosity, after temptations and ordeals, when the free will has been tested by all kinds of sorrows. St. Isaac the Syrian said, Temptation is good for every man, for if temptation was good for Paul, then every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Ascetics are tempted so that their riches might increase. The weak are tempted so that they might be saved from harm. Those sunk in sleep are tempted so that they might be prepared to awaken. Those who are far from God are tempted so that they might approach Him. The riches that a son receives from his father's house are of no profit to him if he receives no instructions from his father concerning them. For this reason, God first tempts and torments and only afterwards shows his gift. It is necessary only to patiently endure these temptations and sorrows with God's help, and we must pray diligently for this gift. Of course, it can be difficult to endure this when our surroundings are unfavorable. But after all, Lot was saved even when he lived among the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. I read the book of Revelations and predictions of St. Nihilus the Myrrh streaming while I was still in Russia. In my opinion, it contains many wonderful things, much of which is coming true. I think at at any rate, the basic belief expressed in it that the end of the world is near is correct. Letter 21 Fighting the Passions and Dispassion Respected M. A. Until a man achieves dispassion, he abides in the passions. The passions are, however, strongly manifest only in some people. In others, they are inactive. But inactivity of the passions is not dispassion. In this case, the passions are merely latent. When a man enters into battle with them, they assert their existence. Many are the saints, said St. Simeon the New Theologian, but few are the dispassionate, those of perfect dispassion, and there is a great difference between the two. Perfect purity is superior to the gift of miracle working, said Abba Nestorius. St. John of the Latter spoke about the correct way to fight the passions. Anyone who tries to struggle against his flesh and to overcome it by his own efforts is fighting in vain. For unless the Lord overturns the house of the flesh and builds the house of the soul, the man who wishes to overcome it has watched and fasted for nothing. What must one do? Bring the infirmity of your nature to the Lord, confessing your feebleness in all things, and without your knowing it, you will win for yourself the gift of chastity, wrote St. John of the Latter. These words were meant, of course, for the virtuous, not for the negligent and the careless. M.R.O. asked me, When I received communion, the priest did not announce the words, The servant of God Mary partakes of the precious and holy body and blood of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and for life eternal. Is the communion valid? Of course it is valid. I am not going to write her a separate letter about this. Be so kind as to tell her my answer. 
Letter 22 Preserving Inner Contemplation and Remembrance of God Respected M.A. If external affairs do not allow one to observe external acts of piety, then one must concentrate on inner acts. We must hearken to the words, Keep thy heart with all diligence, that we might not forfeit contemplation of God, and that we might not profane the remembrance of His wonders with vain ideas, but might rather bear everywhere with us, like an ineffaceable seal, holy contemplation of God by constant and pure remembrance in our souls. For this is how we acquire the love for God which both inspires us to fulfill the Lord's commandments and is at the same time maintained by them, becoming enduring and unwavering, writes St. Basil the Great. When we forget about God, passions and evil thoughts arise. Abba Theonis said, Because we withdraw our mind from the contemplation of God, we are imprisoned by the passions of the flesh. What must one do? One must compel oneself to remember God. Compelling oneself to do all things is the godly path. He who compels himself for God's sake is likened to a human confessor. Letter 26 Self-Reliance versus Social Life, Fasting and Prayer You ask, how can one reconcile a desire to be self-reliant with concern for the salvation of one's neighbor? I will answer in the words of St. Gregory the Theologian. One must find a happy medium between total isolation and social life. In other words, one must be self-reliant, but, when necessary, one must also attend to the salvation of one's neighbor. One must, however, know one's own limits. Your last question was, What should I do if fasting and prayer are of no profit to me? I do not understand. Profit is one thing, but awareness of it is another. One might not notice any profit from fasting and prayer, but this does not mean that there is none. However, if one's conscience is uneasy about something, then one must fast and pray again. Please accept my greetings for the coming Christmas holiday. 31. How often should one receive communion of the holy mysteries of Christ? You ask, How should you prepare your son for his first communion of the holy mysteries, and can you and he take communion on March 25th and on Good Thursday as well? To your first question I answer, Explain everything to him in the simplest possible words, and he will understand. Children love simple things, and any boring discussion is a burden to them. As far as you are concerned, you and he may take communion on March 25th and on Good Thursday as well. In general, it is best to follow the instructions on communion which St. Seraphim of Sarov gave to the nuns at Divievo. St. Seraphim ordered the nuns to take communion of the holy gifts during the four fasts, on the twelve feasts, and even on the other major holy days. In general, the oftener, the better. Of course, one must prepare oneself accordingly. If not, then one should refrain from communion of the holy mysteries. It is good to nurse the sick. On weekdays, do not be dismayed if it prevents you from going to church. But on Sunday and on holy days, you should try to be in church unless the illness is serious. 36. How to prevent sorrows from disturbing one's peace of mind and confession. You ask, Can one keep the sorrows which befall one from disturbing one's peace of mind? In order to answer this question, one must differentiate one's own peace of mind from spiritual peace, which is grace-filled. Sorrows always disturb one's peace of mind to a greater or a lesser extent, but they can never disturb spiritual, grace-filled peace. For this reason, we must work at acquiring this peace throughout our earthly lives. Next, you ask, can you confess to a priest that you have something against him? When dealing with most ordinary priests, one should not do this. This will only bring harm and will be of no profit. It is enough to confess in a general way without indicating who is involved. 54. The Proper Way to Conduct Spiritual Warfare 
Our life is a continual spiritual battle. This is why one must be surprised not when the battle is evident, but rather when it is not. In order to be victorious in this battle, however, one must conduct it properly. And in order to conduct it properly, one must study the writings of the Holy Fathers. Even one's reading of the Holy Fathers must be done properly, not in a disorderly fashion. Try, I say to you in the words of Bishop Ignatius Branchininov, to read the books of the Holy Fathers relevant to your own way of life, so that you will be able not only to admire and enjoy reading the writings of the Fathers, but to put them into practice as well. A Christian living in the world should read the works of the great prelates who wrote for lay people, teaching Christian virtues appropriate to those who spend their lives amid material concerns. Monks in monasteries should read other works, and still other works should be read by recluses and those keeping a vow of silence. Studying the virtues without taking into account one's own way of life can lead to daydreaming and delusion. What works did Bishop Ignatius have in mind? The works of St. John Chrysostom, the prelate Tikhon of Zadonsk, and similar writings. From this point of view, your attitude, which you expressed in the words, I can no longer attempt to fulfill the three vows of monasticism, cannot be recognized as correct. You must try to lead not a monastic life, but a Christian life, spiritual in its general manifestations, but not monastic in form. Then your life will be more properly structured and your mind will be calmer.